This is a um, this is a multicultural uh, international climbing team here, uh, Kiwi and French. And um, last year, pre-COVID, they um, we managed, they managed to get into the European Alps, and um, that's what they're going to talk to us about this evening, which will be uh, very very exciting, I'm sure. Over to you guys. Okay. Hey, Peter. Hello, everybody. So this talk has sort of been hanging around for about six months because it was supposed to be a pre-COVID talk sort of hot off the press, so to speak, after our trip last year, and then here we are in October. But the slides haven't changed, and the memories haven't faded, so we're going to chat about a trip that um, five of us did last summer in Europe. Um, we did the trip to go and climb Mont Blanc, and do some other peaks more or less as warm-ups. Um, our principal reasons for doing it, you'll, you'll, you'll hear about, but Geoffroy is from there, well he's from Paris, but he has a chalet in the area, so it was perfect, because if we couldn't climb, we could sit in his chalet and drink wine. <laughs> and eat croissants. And we did a lot of that. But, we also did a lot of climbing, we, we hit the heat wave, um, which made for some interesting um, conditions, but we persevered with those. We had thunderstorms and, and other sort of burnt soles of feet and a, a, a din car, a rental car, a very expensive one, all sorts of things. But we got through it and it was a great trip. So I'm going, what we're going to do is I'll say a few things, maybe introduce the first few slides when we get to Chamonix, Geoffroy is going to say um, something about the area that he knows extremely well. And then in terms of the climb itself, or the climbs, we will just uh, add lib between us. So sit back and here we go. So just for the, just for the record though, I'm, uh, I, I, we've got a family house here, but I've been in New Zealand for 35 years. So uh, I've been born in... He's a Kiwi. You're a Kiwi. Oh, my, uh, and that's why I've lost completely my accent as well. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever recognised that I'm French. <laughs> okay, so Mont Blanc, which is the atmosphere way back there, is uh, the highest point in the European Alps. It spans uh, the borders of France and Italy. Uh, it has its own Italian name, Monte Bianco, uh, which means White Mountain, which is a perfect description for it. It was first climbed in 1786, and the first ascent of Mont Blanc really was the, is considered to be the start of, of alpinism. Um, Chamonix and the mountain, yeah. considered the birthplace of modern mountaineering, for just under 5,000 metres high. So it's not, it's not particularly high, but it's high enough that you do have to spend some time acclimatising. And uh, the, we did have an, a little incident high on the mountain coming down where we had to assist someone who hadn't obviously done enough acclimatising. And um, it's rated 11th in the world by um, typographic prominence. I think that means that in terms of height gain from the valley floor, uh, it's considered pretty uh, one of the big mountains. What is the value for? Chamonix. Well, it's banged on 1,000. Chamonix, uh, Chamonix railway station is uh, every every railway station finds that the height is banged on 1,000. So it's about 3,000 meters. Yeah, so it's just appears to be about 3,500 foot Everest. Yeah, that's right. And which was one of the ammo that Strip was doing from the valley floor? And I reckon it must be, I don't know, it must be around 3,000. So there was five of us on the trip. Now, um, there was Geoffroy here. Now, Geoffroy and I, we have known each other for quite a while. Uh, we haven't had too many fights. We've done a little bit of climbing together, not a lot, I dare say, but the climbs that we have done together in New Zealand and in Nepal have been wonderful. So um, we we really enjoy climbing together and, and being on, on a team. Uh, 
Joffa wanted to call he Joffa has climbed the mountain before, uh, but he wanted to take his two boys, uh, two of his three boys, Remy and Felix, to the summit on this trip. So um, that was wonderful. The young fellas, good skiers, uh, trampers, done a little bit of mountaineering. So um, good on their feet. So it was a joy to have them along, and I think they really enjoyed climbing with sort of us oldies. But let's talk about the Madonna, though. The Madonna, we can talk, it's the latest slide. Oh, okay. But yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah. Madonna, every, every yeah. peak has a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a question is it on New Zealand climbing grades, um, the one you're going to take the two boys up, is it a, a two or a three? Or a, yeah, the, the, the climb itself? Yeah. Well, we can talk about that later, okay. later. But it's, uh, it's okay. technically it's a long climb. The way we wanted to do it was long, a lot of vertical height, a lot of descent. Technically, reasonably straightforward. Yep. Okay. A little bit of mixed climbing. A little bit of yeah. mixed climbing, yeah. Uh, and we had, we always invited all kinds of along because you've always got to have someone that you can blame, pick on, <laughs> you know. And once again, it was Marty Hunter. I don't know if you people know Marty Hunter. He's been around for a few years. Uh, he, he and I actually went to school together. Um, and Unknown to me, Marty and Joffre were best mates as well. Um, and it was not until we sort of a chance discussion on planning a trip to Nepal uh, five years ago that we all sort of made the connections and we've stayed in touch ever since. Uh, and then there's yours truly. Um, yeah. So, wonderful little team. I mean, I think I've said before about climbing, uh, I think. I mean, we all like to do nice climbs, but in many respects, it's the people you go climbing with is, is the best part of it. And if you go climbing with good people, like-minded, um, you have more confidence to climb harder anyway, because you, you, you've got a more cohesive team. So we flew from New Zealand to France, uh, to by the Middle East. We all. We, Remy was in, was already there? Yeah, was already there. Yeah, the rest of us flew over. Uh, and we arrived uh, in Geneva, and Geoffroy was already there. So I'm just going to hand over to Geoffroy, and he's going to talk about the wonderful family chalet and, and introduce sort of the local mountains and give me a break. So this, is, this is the family chalet that I've been in those. Family for since 1969. So we're back about 40, 40 years. 50 years because we did celebrate the 50 years last year. 50 years, and that's um, the, it's um, it's rather at the top at the end at the tip of the Chamonix Valley, so it looks on um, it looks toward the Empire Valley. We have we have a slide on that as well. It's an old farm that's been transplanted from a flooded valley on the other side of the range. Uh, by, a, by a dam in the 60s, and uh, one of the guys just transported the farm and put it on the, on the concrete or a block, block and then inside it's it was modern at the time. It's, and so it's, it's, it's been in the family for 50 years and it's, it's very simple, but it's, it's where my hurt belongs. When people ask me where you are from France, I always say here, although originally Paul already betrayed me and said I was originally from Paris. Um, it's about 1130 meters of vertical uh, above sea level, so it's just a bit above uh, Chamonix and Les Ouches, and it's in the village of Les Ouches, which is at the head of the valley. Mm -hmm. And it's great because you've got the uh, a version of temperature of summer and winter, so it's a little bit fresher in summer than the 40, 35, 40 degrees in the valley, and it's a little bit warmer in winter than the minus 30. So it's, it's just above the top layer. So that's, um, that is Charos. It's, it's, um, uh, classified village now. All those farms are all old, old Savoyard farms. There's still some uh, cattle with their big belt, you know, their big clarins. And on the background is the Chamonix Range, the, the Mont Blanc Range there, with uh, Mont Blanc is right behind there. The Aiguille de Midi, where they put the, the highest uh, peripheric or cable car, and then the Aiguille, uh, Aiguille de Chamonix. But those chalets are absolutely magnificent old farms, very well restored. This is a, a a really peaceful, there's no cars, not that fast, but 50 
minutes, 15 minutes or a more, 40 minute walk, and it's a really peaceful place. And it's not fully protected anyway, so it will never be overbuilt. Uh, and I really strongly advise you if you go to Chamonix, do the walk. Uh, so that's a June, that's a mid, late June, late June photo. You can see there's quite a bit of snow, there's, and you will see, I'm not sure there's a photo later on, but when I left, uh, late July, that was absolutely, this was not this, but this was really dry. Nearly here, a bit of snow there, there of course, but always in the It's very dry. So I'm going to go back to the slide. That's on the other side of the, so the, the Chamonix Valley is right behind there. You can um, sort of uh, guess it, and that's um, on the, what we call it, Zigri Rouge, the red, the red, um, red needles or the red peak. A very ferruginous, sort of a messy type of rock. And on the other side, the Valley Chamonix is more really granitic, really uh, very high, very thick crystal um, red granite, very different geology, quite interesting. And that's the, the bear. The bear is a really famous peak, which is uh, one of the very well isolated by the Mer de Glace and the Glacier d'Argentière there. And it's quite a magnificent summit, which has got no easy route, so it's quite, um, it's quite a nice peak to do all the routes on the bear are quite difficult. And we, that was one of our training day there, walking up in the grass and looking at the marmots and all those little um, rodents. Um, interesting thing. Uh, good. So this is a, this one here is Chardonnay, and that was on our list. We, we didn't end up doing it for a variety of reasons, but that's also a really nice piece, which uh, it's got some magnificent wood on the side of it. That's the Aiguille du Midi. So the Aiguille du Midi is known for the highest, I'm not sure anymore, but it used when I was a kid, it was the highest telephone in the world. Although we are very proud of it. It's probably a higher one now in the US at the moment. Um, it starts from Chamonix, right in Chamonix, go right to the top. It was built in, it was built in the, um, I don't know, the 50s? It was, well, it was definitely in the 50s. I was even thinking it was, it was a bit earlier than It was definitely in the 50s. They attempted to build it before the war because there's an, um, a failed attempt that side. There's still the station there before the war. But after the war, they took it, tried again. Um, that's a, I mean, and it's a bliss and not. But it would never be built now because we never get, and we, in, for, in some ways, it's better for to make it but the access to the mountains that it provides is fantastic. You grab it in the mountains, you grab it in the morning at 6.30 and you're right, 20 minutes later, you're right in the middle of the glacier and it, uh, it provides a real, um, real access to a lot of climbing. This, this, those climbs are pretty, pretty technical and pretty committed. Um, Formigo, this one is one I did, the Formigo, there's a quite, a, quite a high climb and it looks easy. The good thing is when you're up at the top, so it's not really a key way of climbing. Yeah. Yeah. That's the European work. And you can see Dom du Goutier there. As Mont Blanc is just, you can get Mont Blanc just here. So the route we do at Mont Blanc, we arrive, we arrive just here from the other side. And then from the okay, so let's so let's talk about that. So yeah, we did some we did some valley walks, uh, really. To, just knock out some of the cobwebs and we arrived in, in, in Chimney and, and it wasn't, oh, the thunderstorms were still, the thunderstorm seasons were still happening so there was thunderstorms. They cleared in after Dota and then we got this heat, we got the European heat wave almost immediately and that stayed with us right through. We had, how long did we have there, a week and a half? Two weeks stayed with us. It was it was hot, 40, 35, 40 degrees in the valley, um, and those sort of nice walks up the so up through farmland and and on nice trails. They were great, but boy did we perspire and we drank quite a bit of beer when we got to the top. <laughs> so after a few of those, we decided to go up the Guild to meeting and climb a peak. Um, which we'll talk about in a moment, and generally put the rope on and see if we could, st and our band lines, and see if we could still get our act together. Now, as we all know, five people, uh, you know, two young fellas who hadn't done much rope climbing, um, 
step out of the group of me, first thing you do is you've got to descend quite a sharp little wedge down onto, a, down onto the glacier. And um, we roped up and we sort of, we went down. Now, when you arrived at the bottom of the group of me, everybody was all kitted up with all your ice screws, like, everybody was super organised. We turned up. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, it's just chaos. So we, we had to sort ourselves out at the top. Then we had to go down the steep little slope, short roping, which is something we talk, I'll talk about shortly, or Shopra will talk about it. Should practice our short roping, which is a technique the guys use it in New Zealand, but generally climbers don't short rope work in this country. And, and we hit, but we wanted to short rope because of Felix and Remy. We just the practice, best practice over there with novices is to short rope them. So, so we had to short rope down this this slope. I got told off by a French guy because I've done it all wrong. We go on to the glacier, roped up, and then we had to do the coils, work out how many coils, you know, all the carry on. So people were walking past to go rock climbing up these beautiful slabs. And cracks, which is, as Shopwa said, is, is one of the, one of the great things you can do. You can get up there, straight onto granite, beautiful granite. Do your climbs, the technical. Get off, go and have a beer at the top, and back down to the valley. So, um, so here's a photo of us down on the glacier, getting our gear together, and and working out what to do. Um, yeah. It took a while, didn't it? Yeah, it took a little it while. It took a little while, you know. Yeah. How do you tie off your loops, you know? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we got there. But it was also the first first outing in the park. Yeah. Before. My boy had hadn't done much of it. No. And the when you walk out of the teleferry, literally you walk. There's a tunnel in the rock. I don't know when many of you have been there. There's very narrow. You walk in this tunnel. And then you walk out of the tunnel, so you get ready, you put your eyes, your orbits, and then you get out of the, of the tunnel, which is really a tunnel, maybe a hundred bigger than there, and then you're on this ridge as, yeah, they're on this ridge, oh, that's no, not that way, but you're on the ridge. It's right, it goes right down the tunnel, it's quite impressive. So people who've never been on the mountain, it's fantastic because it's coming. And that's why we shot roll. <laughs> that's why we shot there's roll. Huh? There's a railing at the top. No, no, there's no railing. No, no, there's no, no, there's no railing. No, 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 you're on the mountain. That's why we shot roll because if you long roll, if they fall, you go with them. So we shot roll because you're basically right behind the guide or the leader is right behind, and then you hold them. You know, the yeah, that's the right. Well, yeah. It's, there used to be a handrail. Yeah, there used no, to be. They, no, no, no. There's, there's, there's been there. There was. No, no. No, on the ridge. There's a ran rail in winter ah. because the skier go with their ski yeah. for the Valley Blanche. Right. There's never been a handrail in summer. Ah. Okay. Uh, but in winter there's mm -hmm. handrail, which is where where they take it. So it's probably bigger than some other colonizers it's really popular. And so in winter it's skiing, and you ski from the top right onto Chamonix. It's about a five hour ski. Yeah, I've done that. Yeah. And so, yes, you, you've got your ski, and you've got your ski boots, and so you have a But in some other it's not. Yeah. And so, yeah, if you fall, you just go back to Chamonix. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, this body, short rope, and relax, I think. And as Shopra said, get very close, just a metre, one metre, a metre and a half, you have your coils in your hand. The coils have got to go through your hand in such a way that you, you, can, you can arrest the slip straight away, but if you need more time, you can drop some coils. It gives you a few more seconds to have another go, stuff like that. So it was a completely, to me anyway, it was very foreign. And, and by the end of the trip, I was actually quite confident go, when we were doing Mont Blanc, Summit Ridge, which is exposed in places, I was quite happy short roping um, Felix or Joe, um, Remy. But at the beginning, yeah, it was it was a learning curve. It's like, you know, if he falls off, well, I'm going to fall off. You know? It's like learning to be a guide. It's like learning to be a guide. Yeah. yeah. But it was, it was really good, you know. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, when I first came to New Zealand, I pretty used to short roll when I got, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's it's just very weird. But yeah, um, guiding, when I was guiding in Chamonix, we always thought about this. Because I was one of the nine fine guys in Chamonix for a few years and then short walk You don't show up on glacier when there's crevasse, but on those slopes there's no crevasse, so you show If you long walk, you don't see what your client or your, your partner is doing. When you're short you're right there, you watch every of their steps and you catch them before the fall. And it's really, I mean, I, cool. 
One of the things that struck me being being my first time in Shepherd is how many times this was here. It is the place you go to Mount Cook, okay, there's a few climbers, a few. You go to Chamonix, you go up to Guilds and Eden, there are climbers everywhere. You know, dozens and dozens and dozens. How many guides are there in Chamonix? It's like 150 or 700? Yeah, there's some of the list that there would be probably 400 to 70 somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yes, and unbelievable. There's climbers everywhere. Do you want a wilderness experience? Like a Don't go to Chamonix. <laughs> Oh, but, oh, ask us where to go. There are okay. still some places where you, as usual, there are still some places where you can go. Okay, so this was... Okay. There's not that many people. No, no, that's why. This, yeah. You want to talk about... Uh, <laughs> more broadly yeah, that you can, those one, you see that we can see right to here. That's the road. Yeah, that's it. You, and you go. Okay. So this was our warm-up peak. Pretty much just a slog, but it's, it's nice and high, over 4,000 metres. So... We were going up this peak just to acclimatise. Um, we went from the valley floor, thousands, to up to the summit in five hours, something like that. Arrived at the summit, splitting headaches as you, as you could expect. Um, but we followed, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward work, as Shokwa says, you come up through here, through the glacier. Um, I don't think I saw any crevasses, but they're obviously there. Uh, up through this slope, there's a, some people there. Negotiate the shrun, which was which was easily negoti negotiable then, but I think within a month and oh, a, no, within two weeks, within two weeks oh, no, it had gone. Uh, it was about freezing at this even at four, over four thousand metres, and then up the slopes, um, and then along to the summit. Now. So it was good. It was it was just it was a bit of a grunt. We did to something about Russell. Yeah, we're about Russell. Russell. Now we did stop just here, just at the top of this sort of avalanche, this cone what was it? of debris. We stopped the We were probably yeah. six or seven hundred meters below the summit. Yeah, something like right that. This is where one of our Russell Braddock was caught in an avalanche, set off by people higher up. He was. He was off to ski that, that face. Um, and you've got some guides and, some, and a, a party above released um, a slab and he had nowhere to go and he was buried. And he, he was buried there and he died. Some of you will know about Russell. So we, um, Marty and Chopra and I all knew Russell. So we, we stopped for a few minutes just to pay our respects. Um, and then we carried on, and it was a hot. It was. So when, when I was when I was guiding, it was one of my favorite one of my favorite climbs that one can see. But you can see four two the parties there. Really, you know, quite a bit technical, but very easy. You get in the morning, you climb there, some men and down, and so very nice to mix reasonably. You know, quite a good good climb to do in the day. So the back at back at home at three, you know, two in the afternoon. Three in the afternoon. There is a there is a hut up here. It's around the corner, isn't it? Oh, there it is. There, yeah. So you can go up if you, if you want alpine stars to do like routes like that. You can go up, spend the night in the hut, have your lunch, have your dinner, have your breakfast, get out two o'clock in the morning uh, when there's a real obviously good freezes at that altitude, and and yeah, go and do go and do um, steeper ice climbing. Is that one of the serious ones? Yeah, it's all Yeah. Uh, that's a nice photo. Oh, that's from the summit looking across the Mont Blanc. There it is. The, the only mount, I mean, people, some of the New Zealand climbers or climbers I've talked to go to Chamonix, they go there for technical climbing. They're not really interested in Mont Blanc because it's just, to, to them, it's, it's not. It's not challenging, um, but it's a, it's a, just a stunningly beautiful mountain. The only mountain in New Zealand I can sort of compare it to is Eden de Beaumont, top of that of the Tasman. So it's just it's just that lovely snowy 
peak, beautiful, dominates, you can see it for miles, it's, it's sort of got an elegance all, uh, all of its own, you know, it might not have the sort of the steepness of the Araki or, or the, you know, the beautiful sort of ice summit of Tasman, but it, it's got its own, it's got its own beauty. Uh, yeah, so the technical climb on Mont Blanc on the, on the Italian side, so um, Peutre and Sentinelle and the uh, Brenne Vasper, and, uh, uh, they're all on the, the Italian side. They all that really committed climb, really in the middle. Uh, really white, probably all uh, really the whites are really, really big. Uh, and you don't see the prevailing, the prevailing weather come from the north so you don't see the weather at the pass over there. Those are very serious climbs. Do you want to talk about discussions about routes we're going to do? Yeah, so there's a number route that we discussed. One of, the, one of the first routes we discussed was the Arete de l'Innominata, which is this Arete here, and plunge after that we count it. And it's quite a bit more technical. That's, that used to be called an Italian normal route, because, uh, but it's really, really long. And um, we're not quite sure about the, the quality of the... the the upper fourth or the upper part of it, the upper few hundred meters, which were uh, sometimes really rough, especially in, at the, at the, at the, in summer when it gets hot, especially in, in a mechanic tune like that, in the heat waves, we are concerned about rock course. So we decided not to do that one. And also with my two boys, we are not really that technical. So we decided not to do the Arrête de l'Illuminat, which is still something I've never done. The other classic route which is done is called the Trois Mont Blanc, so the three Mont Blanc, you've got the Mont Blanc du Tacu, the one we that's taken the photo taken from. Mont Maudit here, but actually just go here on the on the shoulder, and then you go down and you do Mont Blanc and then you go down. And that's a really nice route because um, you're above four thousand meters the whole day. Uh, it's not it was not for me it was not a satisfactory to take people for their first climb of Mont Blanc because you have to fly. You almost have to take the teleferic, and it does cut, especially for kiwis, it does cut a bit. And even for me, it cuts the, uh, the, the beauty of it. And so we did, the, and the third option we had was to leave from the chalet, from the chalet, and then walk from the chalet, which is the way I did the first time ever when I did when I was 20. I left the chalet, closed the door, walked to the summit along that road here, and then walked down. But then you go and back the same way. So the road we decided to do was, we don't see it now, we have another side up here. The road we did was crossing the range from Italy, from the valley floor, to Italian valley floor to French valley floor. So it's a, it was a, although it was easy, it was symbolically a very, a very nice um, few days. So that's, um, that's uh, the head of the valley of the Mer de Glace, the Sea of Ice. Um, and you can see here the Aiguille de Chamonix, so the Aiguille, uh, Aiguille du Pen here, and then the Mont du Taki. So the one, the photo was taken, the, the previous photo was taken from here. That's the Grand Capucin, which one of the famous, very, very difficult uh, rock climb, pure rock climb. And then some of the, one of the peaks we did after Mont du Taki was that one, which is called Tour on the Round. It's pretty sad to see that because when I was a kid, the glacier, and you can see that the glacier was coming here.